Everybody good? All right, hey, welcome back. Um, I know you all were back yesterday, so it's kind of a belated welcome back, but welcome back. I know you had a great week off. So you're able to take care of some things that you probably had going on. You need to take care of being there a week, some rest, different things. We got new students as of yesterday, uh, so I'm hoping, I'm hoping that y'all are welcoming those students, making them feel welcome here at Brown Lake College. Uh, but we definitely have a welcome back type of campaign going on. Y'all had the food yesterday. We want to welcome back with that. I uh, hope that was good. I hope you didn't put in too many calories, but I hope it was good to you. Uh, but secondly, today, uh, one thing we want to do, because we're always trying to make sure we're doing things for your best interest. We want to make sure that you're uh, getting the best experience here as possible as a person and as a student, okay? Not just taking money. We want to make sure that you're getting the best experience here, okay? So what we did is we invited someone in today uh, to speak to you. Very, very amazing person. Okay, he has an amazing story uh, about overcoming obstacles, a major obstacle. He'll tell you about that obstacle, uh, but it was a pretty devastating thing. And I know, me personally, had I gone through it, I'm not sure how I would have reacted to it. Um, he has a great story, though, and his story is basically about him overcoming those obstacles, living life to the fullest, okay, maximizing his potential while he's here on this earth, okay, leaving his fingerprint his blueprint on this on this world before he leaves. And so he wants to be able to talk to you about practical things that you can uh, put into your life, that you can apply to your life, uh, so that you do leave this earth, uh, making sure that you left your fingerprint on this earth and not just taking up space, okay? I'll let him tell his story. I'll let him, this is an amazing story. I want y'all to take notes. Hope you got your pens and papers out because it's really something, some things that you're gonna learn. Take some notes on it, okay? But what I want y'all to do, okay? I want you to help me welcome. All right, very impressive. Uh, speaker in life strategist, okay? Thanks, Jerome Bragg. Welcome to everyone. Welcome. Yeah. Thank you for that. I am honored to be in your space today. Um, I am honored to be in your home, if you will, in your hearts and in your life for this next few minutes. Although we're just meeting, I consider you my family. And I consider you my family because I understand where you are. You are the type of people that said where you were before wasn't enough, and you made a decision that you wanted to go somewhere else. You wanted to be somewhere else better. I understand that. I understand that deeply. That's what I care about. So you're my family today, and I'm honored that you have me in your, in your space. And I have a belief, a philosophy, if you will, that any time anyone gives me their time, I give them time back on their life. So what I'm going to try to do today is give you some time back on your life in exchange for the time you're giving me here today. And what that's going to require, though, we're going to have to set a space here. And set a space, first of all, just be open. Because you may hear something today that you may not have heard before, but if you're open to it, it will change your life. And you have to understand one thing is that this is a huge deal that you're here today. That you're sitting in this very seat today, and you made a decision to come here today. Because somebody you know is not here. Somebody you know is not here, and something you hear today is going to elevate your life. It's going to help you become a new person. And that person who's not here today may never get to hear me. They may never get to see me, but they'll see you. And what you learn to say, and how that affects you, and how you put into practice what you learn today, will be the benefit that they get from our interaction. You will literally be the example for them for how to let their life be better. So <clears throat> make no mistake, this is a big deal that you're here today. It's not just about you. It's about everybody you get to touch from this point on. So I'm honored that you're letting me in this space not just so that I can pour into you, but that you can pour into me, and we can pour into those people who you will touch, those people directly and indirectly. So as you know, Sydney introduced me, I have a story. And my intention today is to share my story and be so transparent that at some point, you look through me and see yourself. That you see your life inside of the story that I'm telling about my own. Because as I said before, my journey was not just lived for me. I understand that now. It was lived so that everybody
anybody who gets to hear it gets impacted by it and they can take what they need from it for their personal lives at the time. So my individual story is a story of breakthrough, of about how do you break through when you've been broken down? How do you get to your dream when everything else seems impossible? How do you make that happen? So let me share my story with you. My story, as I said, starts with the breakdown. And my breakdown started January 1st of 2004. I was living in Washington, D.C. at the moment. And the previous year, 2003, I was working as a counselor and therapist for men and women with HIV and AIDS. Really liked the work, but I didn't love it. It wasn't really what I really wanted to do. At that point in my life, I thought I was going to be a famous singer and actor. I was going to go to New York and in L.A., and I was going to rock it, okay? <laughs> that was my whole dream. And I took this particular job because I liked helping the people. It was, it was something that, you know, was, was consistent with my heart. But it wasn't my dream. And I liked it until it became, it took all of my time. And there was a point where, in my life, I was working, 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 working. I was like, what am I working? I'm not doing what I, what I said I wanted to do. And I kept going like that until the last two weeks of the year. When I got sick, I had like blue-like symptoms, I had a fever, my body was aching, I couldn't really move well. So I stayed home and I started to do the things that I knew how to do. I was taking soup, I, I stopped eating meat, I was meditating, I was going to bed early, trying to do affirmations, things like that, to get better, but I wasn't. I wasn't getting better. And on New Year's Eve, and I'm a big New Year's Eve person, let me just say that. I'm a big New Year's Eve person, I like to party. But I was not partying because I was sick in the bed. And so I called my mom on the phone, and she's a doctor, and she was living in Oklahoma at the time. And I called her and I said, Mom, can you call me in something, like an antibiotic or something, because I just need to get over this so I can go back to work. If nothing else, just get me back to work. And so she told me two things. One, it's illegal for me to call you something from out of state, so I'm not going to do that. And two, you've had these symptoms for a while, so you need to go see, be seen by somebody so that you can get checked out to make sure that whatever this is, it's fully gone. So I called my friends on the phone to come pick me up. Now, mind you, this is New Year's Eve. So each one of them told me, I'll come pick you up after I get through with this party. <laughs> so I had to wait, and about 3 o'clock in the morning, my friends came and got me, and they took me to the hospital. And the doctors, you know, the doctor came to me, and he was running his normal, you know, conversation, how long have you had this, what's been going on, all that kind of stuff. And he figured he probably needed to run some blood tests just to find out what's happening. So they ran, he ran a blood test, and while I was waiting for the blood test, and when he came back in to give me the, blood, the results of the blood test, something very interesting happened. Instead of just being the one doctor that I was talking to, there was a team of doctors flooding into the room. And they surrounded my bed, and they did something very interesting. They handed me the telephone. And I took the phone, and they said, you have a call. And on the phone was my mom. She had called in to check on me to make sure I had gotten to the hospital was okay. But something very different was happening with my mom when I picked up the phone. She was crying. And she said to me, I'll be there in the morning, and then she hung up the phone. And I knew then that it was more than the flu. You see, my mom was always my rock around being ill or being sick. She was always, boy, take this medication and go to bed, you'll be all right. Or you just need to be asleep stop bothering me, it'll be all right in the morning. It was never anything that could shake her around her son being ill. But she was sobbing on the phone when she hung up. And so as I was processing the fact that my mother was sobbing, I looked up at this team of doctors come around my hospital bed, and I knew then they had something to tell me. And I said, Doc, give it to me straight. And the doctors told me, they, they kind of closed in around me closer. And the lead doctor told me, son, you have about seven days to live. You're being diagnosed with kidney failure, pneumonia, pancreatitis, anemia, 20 pounds of a load of fluid on your body, a fluid-packed lung, and just in case 
this situation wasn't delicious enough for me, I had a parasite in my stomach. And the entire situation had progressed to a point where the doctors believed they could not do anything else for me. So they told me to get my affairs in order, and they left the room. And as they left the room, there's a darkness that comes in when you find out you're dying in seven days in a hospital room, and you're alone with no family and no friends. But there's something else that happens. You ask yourself three questions. And those three questions you ask when you're dying are, did I live enough? Did I love enough? And did my life really matter? Well, I hadn't felt like I lived enough. You know, not only was I young at the time, I was 23 years old at that time, but I wasn't living my dream. Remember I told you, I was working for something that I didn't really want to do. I liked it, but it did not sing my song in my soul. And there were other dreams that I wasn't doing. You see, I had lived a life of not me, not yet, and not now. But now I'm having more time. And I didn't feel like I loved enough because I didn't feel like I fully expressed the love I had in my heart for the people in my life. And I didn't feel like I fully expressed the love in my heart towards myself. You know, I would look in the mirror and think I was fat. Or look in the mirror and think I was a failure and I hadn't got to where I wanted to be. Just being up on myself. So I didn't fully love me yet. And I didn't feel like I really lived a life that mattered because I didn't feel like I was standing in my purpose. I didn't feel like I was going to leave the world a better place than when I found it. So here I was in this hospital room with seven days left to live, faced with this conundrum of dying like that. And even though I had a different perspective about death, I was not scared to die, but I was horrified of dying like that. Because what I knew was the life that I had been given in this body was about to end, and it was wasted. So I made a decision at that point that I didn't want to die. I did not want to die, and I was not going to die. That I was going to survive. And so I had already been a student of the mind, body, spirit connection. I believe in things like the law of attraction and the mind can create things, and we can, we can create our dreams and all that. I believed in that. But previously, I had been using those things to, like, get $5 when I was broke to use some Chinese food to eat. <laughs> or, you know, I'm running late for the movies to meet my friends, so let me get a parking space in the front of the mall. Something like that. But this time, it had to be really real. If it was really real, it had to be real for me. It had to be real right now, and I had seven days to prove it. So I threw the whole kitchen sink at this situation. Everything I had been reading about, everything I studied, everything I said I knew, I just threw it out. I was meditating, I was visualizing, I was affirming, I was eating right, I was just doing everything. Just anything you could possibly do, I did it. A month later, I walked out of the hospital. I was in the hospital for an entire month. Two months after that, I was fully recovered. And my life was great until it wasn't. And it wasn't great just a year and a half later that I found myself back in that same hospital, in the exact same hospital bed, with the exact same two doctors, with the exact same diagnosis. And this time, I had 48 hours to live. And when the doctors left my room this particular time, there was a different set of questions that I asked myself. Two mainly. One, how did I get here? And the second one was, what do I need to do so that I never find myself in this situation again? And what came up from within me to answer that first question, how did I get here, was I had learned, like the quintessential college student learns, and all of you all in here, you don't have to raise your hand, I just know you know because you're going to identify with what I'm talking about. The quintessential college student who crammed for his exam the night before just to pass the test. Uh-huh. But that information doesn't change you. You don't become a new person because of what you learn. And the second part, how do I not get here again? I had to not only learn quickly, but I had to learn thoroughly. Not just about how to make my dreams come true, but who I really am, and how does this really operate? So I made a commitment that I was going to learn thoroughly. I was going to take a journey so that I could learn thoroughly about how do I not just survive, but finally live. Because there's a difference. 
So, as you can see, I'm alive, I'm well, I'm not hooked up to a dialysis machine. Now, it took me seven years to finally recover the second time. And I was on dialysis for seven years. Until it finally clicked through. Until I finally got it. Until it finally worked out for me where my body fully recovered again and I stepped into the dream that I wanted to live instead of just simply surviving. And what I'm here to do tonight with you all is I'm here to share with you the one top thing that I learned that saved my life. Not just my body life but the life of my dream that allowed me to stand here today and speak with people like you, because I'm living my dream today. I always wanted to do something like this. I told you I wanted to sing and act. Well, a little bit of that is up in here. I'm not going to sing for you today, <laughs> but a little bit of that is up here today. But the reason I wanted to sing and act is because I wanted to affect people. I wanted to impact people with what I was doing. So I am doing that in a big way. I travel the world speaking to people, all over the world speaking but as I said before, you're my family, and I'm going to pour into you this one thing that saved my life, so that you can save your lives, not your physical life. Now, if that's something going on with your body, this will save that too. But I'm invested in the life that's in here, the dream life that wants to be born through you. How do you save that life so that it's not just surviving, but that it's thriving? So the first thing that saved my life was that I had a vision. I had a vision, a vision of what I wanted for myself and where I was going, no matter what anybody else said about it. You see, one of the things that was happening with my situation was nobody in my circle believed that I was going to be better. Now, my family wanted me to be better. My mother wanted me to be better. She wanted her son to live. My father wanted his son to live. But her experience and her background as a medical doctor said to her, your son is not going to make it. Your child will not make this, will not see out of this. But something about a vision is enough for you to have it if nobody else has it. It's enough for you to have it. So the first thing you have to do in order to save your own life is get a vision for yourself. What is it that you want for your life? I knew that my vision was I was not only going to survive, I was going to thrive. I was going to fully recover. That was my vision. I saw myself fully recovered. I saw the end result of me being fully recovered, speaking to people just like you. I saw myself being happy and living those dreams. You said, I had dreams for myself. I wanted to see the other side of the world. I wanted to take a cruise. I wanted to get a six pack. <laughs> okay. I had dreams for myself that I wanted to live into. Okay? And being sick or being on dialysis wasn't part of that vision. Because I'm going to tell you something being on dialysis is not sex. <laughs> <laughs> all right? It's not sexy. They would put a catheter in my chest, and it went all the way down into my heart, and it stuck out like this to pull the blood out. And I could not see myself wearing a tank top on the beach with this catheter in my chest. Okay? So I had a vision for my life. My vision did not include illness. It was something else. And so I had a vision and I held to my vision, no matter what was happening. No matter what the doctors came in and were talking to me about, I held my vision. No matter what my parents were talking about, I held my vision. No matter what anybody else was talking about, no matter what the outside circumstances in my life were talking about, I held my vision. You've got to have a vision, and you've got to hold it. Right? And then the second part of this, is you have to believe in your vision. It's not enough just to see where you're wanting to go, because if you don't believe it, it's not going to happen. I believed that I was going to get better. No matter what was going on, like I told you before, nobody else in my circle believed that I was going to get better. But it's enough to believe in you by yourself. If you have your own beliefs, that'll catapult you out of your situation. I believed it. 
As a matter of fact, I created a circle around me. It was about this wide. And if you came into this circle, the only conversation that you can have with me was I can, I will, and I am. That's the only conversation that was allowed in this space here. And when I tell you, you have to protect your circle. So when they came, Jerome, you can do this. Jerome, you will get better. Jerome, you are getting better right now. And anything other than that has to back out. It has to back up. As my mother can tell you today, if she was standing right here, she'll tell you about the time she came into my hospital room, on my hospital bed, laying next to my hospital bed, crying on the hospital bed, sobbing, saying, you're not going to make it. Her son in an oxygen mask with blood flowing out of his body, and he turns his head to her, mustered with the energy that I had in my body, and said, if you're going to continue to say that, you have to leave the room. Because I can't hear anything other than what's supporting my vision. What kind of space do you have around you? What kind of voices are you allowing in your space? Because if they're not saying, I, you can, you will, and you are, they need to back up a few feet. And they can come in when they get it right. And if you don't have the belief in your vision right now, you need to borrow somebody else's. <laughs> Now, and the second time, why it took me seven years to do this was because my belief was wavering. I didn't have it strong enough in the beginning. It was the second time I was wondering if, if it wasn't going to happen. Did I not do what I thought I knew how to do? What was happening? Was I not worth it? All this craziness that we tell ourselves, we all had that, right? So I had to get somebody else's help with my belief. And since nobody in my circle really believed, I had to go outside of my circle. I went to the library, and I bought some books. I bought some inspirational books and some educational books that said, Jerome, you can do it. Now, they might not have been necessarily speaking to my situation, but they were speaking to my soul. You can do this. You will do this. I listened to audio programs from great speakers, great inspirational people that said, somehow, some way, you will find a way. I borrowed their belief until mine became strong enough to stand on its own. So when you have a vision, you have to believe in it. And if you don't believe enough yet, borrow somebody else's. It's enough. It's enough. Stand on somebody else's shoulders that sees the direction that you're going in and you say, you can do it. Until that becomes something that your heart sings inside. And then the last thing that you have to do when you have a vision, after you have created your vision, you know exactly what you want for your life. You have your blinders on it because you believe and you have created your circle that nobody can come inside of that's not speaking that. You have to nurture your vision. You see, a vision is a living thing. A dream is a living thing. And it lives inside of you. One thing that people don't know about your dreams until you get to a situation like me is when you're on your deathbed, whether that's whether that's in a short situation like I had, or whether it's 50 or 60 years from now, something happens. Your dreams come and sit aside your bed and they talk to you. They talk to you whether you can see them as people or whether you can feel them in your heart. And they say, we were given to you, and only you. And only you could have brought us into the world. And if you die now, we have to die with you. Because dreams are a living and if you do not nurture them, they're dying. Because living things only have two things you can do to them. You either nourish them or you deplete them. That's it. There's nothing else you can do. You're either feeding your dream or you're starving it. So you've got to nourish it. Now, how do you nourish your dream? First thing, you've got to build a plan. You have to have a plan of action of how you're going to go about that. So let me tell you something. Success does not happen by accident. Success is a decision that's followed by a plan. I would love to stand here and tell you all that just one morning after they diagnosed me, I woke up and everything was all right. I would love to tell you that. 
But that's not how that worked out. I had to have a plan. I had to put that plan into action. One of the things I had to do was I had to change my eating. So I'm going to raise my hand right now and say, Jerome loves pizza, okay? <laughs> and he loves greasy cheese, and he loves all the toppings on that. But that's not what my body needed at that point. It needed to replenish itself. It needed something different. So I became a vegetarian at that point. I was eating a lot of fresh fruits and vegetables. It was hard. <laughs> okay? It was hard. There were days where I really wanted a slice of pizza. But I had to nourish my vision. I had to work my plan. I couldn't stay up all night watching sports or watching, you know, something funny. I like Family Guy. That's one of my things. I like to laugh. I like Family Guy. It's very silly for me. But it comes on late at night. I could not stay up every night watching that. I had to go to bed early because I knew my body needed to replenish itself. So I had to work my plan. And then there's another part of this, of, of nourishing your vision. It's, and one of the most important parts, actually, and that's surrounding yourself with the people who are going to lift you higher. I'm going to say that again because that's an important thing. I'm going to come across this side of the room this time and say this to the side of the room. You have got to surround yourself with people who are only, underline only, going to lift you higher. Because just like a living thing can only be nourished or depleted, people can only do two things to you. They are either lifting you up or they're pulling you down. That's it. That's, that's it. And I'm just challenge you a little bit here as you're thinking about your dreams listening to me. I want you to think about your five closest friends right now. And your dream. Why don't you think about your five closest friends? And the dream that you have right now, are each one of those people lifting you higher to that dream? Are they, with the conversations that you have with them, are they saying you can do it? You will do it? You are doing it? Or are they pulling you down? You know, one of my mentors said, there's some people we have in our lives that are so negative that if you left them in the dark for too long, they start to develop. <laughs> Do you have some people in your life like that? Well, let me tell you a truth about that. If you continue to keep those people in your life, you will not achieve your dreams, period. Your dreams will die and wither like a plant who does not get enough sun or water. You have got to surround yourself with people who can lift you higher. It's not an easy thing to do, but it's necessary. One of the hardest things I had to do, but I had to do it because I knew I was not going to get well if I didn't, was call the friends of mine who were always crying on the phone about, I'm not going to make it. Everybody says, you know, I'm dying, and say, I love you, but where you are right now is not feeding me. Thank you for the time we spent together. And when I did that, my life went up. My healing went up. Because there is an energy exchange that you have with the people in your life. And if the majority of the people in your life, the energy that they're bringing to you is not lifting you up again, it's either lifting you up or it's pushing you down. You've got to make a decision. So nourishing your dream is surrounding yourself by those people who are going to speak to your dream and they are going to lift you higher because of it. Because here's something. A vision will pull you. When you have a vision and it is strong, it pulls you. It pulls you to the people you need to make meet to help you create that. It pulls you to the places that you need to be in to bring that into fruition. And it pulls you into the experiences that you need to have to make that happen. When I had that strong vision, and I didn't allow anybody in my space who did not share that vision with me, and I nurtured it, and I planned it, it came to life. And that life is standing here before you today. How are you going to nurture your dream? How are you going to nurture your vision? You've got to, because it's got to pull you. And something else, if your vision is pulling you, if you're not being pulled by something, you're being pushed by something. And that push is pain. You see, a vision pulls, pain pushes. 
And if you're tired of being pushed by pain, it's time to be pulled by vision. And the last thing as I'm standing up here before you talking about vision is it's important for you to understand that your vision is not just about you. That dream that was deposited within you is not just for you, but for everybody that gets to see its reality in your life. You will affect people just by living your life. You will give them permission to live their dreams just by living yours. It may not be anything that you say. It might not be anything that you do. You may just be in a grocery store line. And somebody who knew you five years ago will be behind you. And they may never speak to you. They may never make their presence known to you. But they see you and they see the difference in you. And it lights something in them. And they say, I can do it now. I can do it now. Your dreams are not just important for you. They are important for the world. You have to live them. Because as you live them, you give permission to everybody you come into contact with to do the same. And if you don't, you're giving them permission to stay stuck. You have a responsibility to your life to live the visions and the dreams that have been deposited in you by God and by yourself into this world. You are that important. Because now I get to stand here and know that if I was to face death again tomorrow and ask myself those three questions, did I live enough, did I love enough, and did my life matter, I could say hell yes. What about you?
That was the first thing I did when I got up before I, and I made sure that I got up before the doctors when I was in the hospital for that time. I got up before they came in my room. Now, if anybody has been in the hospital overnight, you know those doctors come in your room at 6 a.m. in the morning. Okay? I got up at 5 to read so that I did not hear what they were telling me. Okay? I had this kind of deer in the headlight syndrome, if you will. They would talk to me and they would say, you know, here's your, uh, Jerome, your test results are getting worse, and we see that you're probably going to do kidney transplant, even just to live, but you'll probably be on Dallas for a while, so we see that happening. And as soon as they started talking, I was like, mm-hmm, 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 okay. Mm-hmm. But in my head, I was like, okay, what do we need to do next? What's happening? You're going to make this. Okay, so in order for us, what are we going to have to eat today? What time are we going to meditate today? I was, in my head, I was working my plan. I was nourishing my vision. Whenever somebody started talking to me outside of my space, and they weren't saying, you can, you will, and you are, I was working my own vision in my head. Yes? Well, how, what did this, uh, how did it affect you spiritually? The second time, um, the inner journey I talked about that I had to make a commitment to go to was the spiritual journey. I had to learn who I really am, uh, the truth that my soul really knows. Um, and it's, my whole work is spiritual work today. You know, I, I, I have a, I, I, I what I am the most passionate about is talking about God without having to say it. Okay. Yes. I don't have a question. I just kind of had a comment. Uh, when you said about your people that surround you and how, like, going to school and just making other people see that you're trying to do your best, I just really like that because my, bro- my older brother is 28. He doesn't do much. He sits at home at my mom's. I think going to school has really You know, when you shine your light, your light shines in the darkness, no matter where the darkness is. If you keep your light on, it will illuminate the darkness, the dark places. So that's the responsibility we all have, is to shine your light. And your light is living in your truth and doing and living your dream. Because that's when your light shines the brightest. And when you are taking a step towards that, no matter who's in your life, no matter who's in your life, they see it, and they become drawn to it. You know how people, you know how if you, if you turn a light on outside at night, thousands of insects are drawn to it. And I'm not calling your family insects. <laughs> I'm not saying that. But the concept is the same. If there's a light in the darkness, anything that's been living in the dark gets drawn to the light. Is that really a good thing? Every time, as long as you don't let them turn your light out. <laughs> now, there are going to be some people who can't handle your light. There'll be some people in your life, like we talked about, who do you need in your circle? There'll be some people in your life that can't handle your life. This is what I say to that. If they can't handle your light, let them put on some shades. <laughs> when you were going through an experience that you went through, at one point in time, did you just feel like give it up? You know, I can't tell you that every night, every day was great. Mm-hmm. That every night I was like, oh yeah, I got this. <laughs> There were some times where I was like, this is hard, and I had to cry on my pillow. But I cried on my pillow, and then I got up and I went on. Right. So I'm all about, I'm all about it. If you need to cry, cry your eyeballs out. Give yourself an hour, cry those eyeballs out. But when that hour time goes off, get up and go. Get up and go. But yeah, there will be hard times. The thing is to keep going. You may not always run towards the goal. Sometimes you have to walk. Sometimes you're going to be crawling. But as long as you crawl forward. That's what's important. Yes. You said you had to keep the negativity out of your bubble. Yes. Um, if it was family member or your significant other, mm-hmm. would you still tell them people to get out of your bubble? You know, like my, if my mother was up here today, she would tell you, my son was not playing. Now, you know, I could not cut my family off because I'm their only child, so I wasn't going to do that. You know, but they knew. And as a matter of fact, if you make it plain and clear who you are and what you're going to stand for, the people in your life either have to raise up or they'll raise back for a minute. Now, my family raised up. As a matter of fact, they were like, okay, he's serious about this thing. So it was so funny. 
I have this moment, and I will always remember this. In the hospital, my friends, a group of my friends and family handed it to me all at the same time. And they came in, they just started, they saw me hooked up to all this stuff, and they just started breaking down, crying, and I heard you were there, oh my God, you know, are you gonna be okay? You're not gonna make it. And my mother was like, oh, uh-huh, y'all got to go. Come back, <laughs> Come back tomorrow. Y'all got to go. And she went out and ushered them outside, she talked to them about how to act in my hospital room. And the next time they came back, they were different people. But it's because I had told her who I'm about and what this is going to be in my service. Now, was that, you know, that, that's how serious you have to be about your dream. If you can't tell your people in your life that this is how this is going to go down, then you don't want it bad enough. Yes. So today, you share, I mean, this, this wonderful life that you so share with us. I am, I had that question before, <laughs> you, kind of, you kind of shocked me. Um, right now, I am single. I am loving my singleness. It allows me to, um, I love it. I'm loving my singleness. We have seasons in our life. I believe we have seasons in our life. And every, every, every season does not require you to be attached to somebody. But I will at some point. <laughs> That's what happened. I saw her first. I'll come to you. Yes. During your hard times, did you ever feel that would be easier to get just let go? Um, I had one moment, one moment, and I was living in DC at the time, and everything was going. I had because I couldn't work. So you know, dialysis is tired. Mm -hmm. you know, and you have I had dialysis three times a week, Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, Ooh. four hours a time, and then after that, I was I had to sleep for like five hours. So I was tired. So I was tired, which means I couldn't work, which means I was living in this posh apartment that I couldn't afford anymore. So I had to downscale. And I was just wondering, you know, when is this going to get better? When is this going to get better? Just one day I was walking down 8th Street, which is, which is behind uh, Union Station in D.C. And I was like, it's not worth it. And then I thought, if it's not worth it, why were you still here? If it wasn't worth it, I would have died the first time. Mm -hmm. right. And that vision that I had in me about standing in, in front of those people, those people are worth it. They're going to hear something from this. They're worth it. So, yeah, I only had one time. I only allowed myself that one time. And that was it. And then I, I got me some chicken wings. <laughs> <laughs> I had a day where I said, okay, we're going to turn this around over these chicken wings. <laughs> and uh, the next morning, we went after it again. You know, allow yourself to feel what you feel, but don't stay there long. Right. Don't stay there long. Mm -hmm. You got a question. Uh, so with everything that's happened, has most of like your diet and how you conduct your diet changed? Is it like, mm -hmm. are you still vegan? I would love to stand up here and say I'm a vegan. Mm -hmm. I would love to say that. <laughs> uh, vegan is hard. It's hard. Um, but. I am mostly vegetarian. Right now I'm vegetarian. So I, I probably will eat meat again, probably not in July. I go back and forth. Um, I allow myself that. It's not so much the food that I learned that you eat. It's your attitude about it. And your attitude, more importantly, about yourself. How you think about you is what's really at the cause of a lot of stuff. Uh, but yeah, I eat a lot of fruits and vegetables. I juice a lot. Um, and I eat, I eat what I call clean. I don't eat a lot of processed stuff, uh, if I eat processed stuff at all, actually. Um, and I eat, make sure I eat mostly organic, and the meats and stuff are without antibiotics and stuff. But I'm not, listen to your own body. Your body will talk to you. That's really the lesson. Listen to your body to know what your body needs to heal itself and be well. Any other questions? The friends that um, you had to call and tell them basically bye, have you... Um, talk to them any one of them I am we are friends again and we are friends now this is something that's very interesting about life if you make a decision that your dreams are important to you and that you know I love those people those people were in my heart I love the people I had to let go of but I knew that I wished them well but I wished myself better and what ended up happening is they came back around when they were ready to be the level that I was so I have that one of those friends I am we're, we're very close and he lifted his level he lives his life, he's living his dream, he speaks positively into my life. He lives me higher now, whereas before he did. 
because I have my best friend, she's got congenitive heart failure, and they gave her so many, you know, months now. And I don't know if it's because I'm scared, because we've been best friends for 28 years, but it's like I don't talk to her as much. All she and needs you to do is listen <coughs> right now. You don't even need to talk, you still listen. Anything you hear, be her support. That's it. She understands you were scared. She understands that at her, at her heart level, she hears that. So all she needs is for you to just listen to her. That's all you have to do. You don't have to save her. You don't have to save the world. You just have to be there for her. That's it. question but in your situation when it came to your the mental level did you feel that you had that your conscious mind had to uh, had to what's the like like your subconscious mind get mm -hmm. your conscious mind to realize what's going on or did you feel your conscious mind had to get your subconscious mind to realize um did, did you all hear a question Okay, so what I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew that I knew was that my belief consciously had to be strong enough to go into the subconscious mind. Now, that's, you don't even have to understand that. All you need to understand is you need to really believe what you want is going to happen, even if you don't know how it's going to happen. If you can believe that, everything's going to work out after that. That's all. So if you can believe just consciously, this is going to happen for me, even if I don't know how it's going to happen. And let me give you this one thing for all of you all. If you have a desire in your heart, whatever it is, if you have a desire, at the, second, the, the way for that desire to happen in your life must exist. It must exist. I like to say God cannot give you a desire without also giving you a path to achieve it at the same time. So it must happen. So if anything, I had to remind myself of that. And I had to, I wasn't thinking too much about conscious, subconscious mind, although I understand all of that. But I also know that if you believe in something strong enough, it goes deeper into your subconscious mind. And that'll do the work. Okay. okay. So that was the last question. So I just have a question for you all. And that is. Raise your hand if this applies to you. If you would like, if you have a dream in your life right now, and you would love to work with me for 90 minutes to help you create a plan that will make that dream come true for you. Just raise your name, raise your hand, <laughs> in the air, if you would like that to happen. Okay, so this is what I'm going to do today. If you want that, if you want to work with me, now. Now, people pay me hundreds and sometimes thousands of thousands of dollars to help them with this. But today, this will be free for you. All you have to do is pick one person. All you have to do is fill out a piece of paper that uh, my assistant Josh back here is going to give you with your name and your email address, and I'm going to pick one person today that is going to get a free 90-minute session with me. One person, just put your name. And your email address. <laughs> your name. Just one person today. Put your name and your email address. And I'm going to pick one person. And we're going to set up a session where I work with you for 90 minutes about how to make your individual dream come true. Other than that, I thank you for being here. It's been an honor for me. Uh, I'm going to be in the back, here at my table in the back, if you'd like to talk or if you'd like to talk about what working with me looks like or anything else I have or any other question I wasn't able to get to, to you today, I'll be in the back here for a few minutes that you can talk to me. Other than that, thank you so much from my heart for opening your hearts to me. I hope I gave you some time back on your life. What do you think?